thanks, Michelle, for the warm intro. I am here to talk about delightful devices, uh, in particular, the Internet of Things. Uh, I work with Internet of Things devices every day just to kind of take people's pulse here. How many, how many other people work with IoT devices every day? Okay, a couple hands. Uh, how many people are Internet of Things curious? Awesome. So you guys are here because you don't work with them all the time, but you want to learn a bit more. Perfect. That's, that's the goal uh, of the talk today is to talk to people like you. Um, and for the other expert folks in the room, I think you'll get a kick out of this too. Uh, the, the reason I put this talk together is I've seen way too many headlines like this. The Internet of Things you don't really need. Uh, I feel like I go to meetups and conferences and I read articles and there's a lot of people that feel disappointed with the Internet of Things. And I would say, you know what? In many cases, they're right. IoT can be disappointing. But what really excites me is when I look at IoT devices, I feel like the, they're disappointing in consistent, repeatable ways. And so the way I want to present this talk is focusing on what are those consistent, repeatable ways that devices can be disappointing so we can avoid them and focus on how to make really delightful devices, really delightful IoT devices. Um, since a lot of you guys uh, are not I IoT makers, the, the, everything in this talk is uh, focused on IoT devices for consumers. So everyone here is a consumer, so you should be able to relate to what I'm talking about. We're not doing industrial IoT or anything really esoteric. Um, and more importantly, everyone in this room is here because you're either a designer or a geek, maybe you're a business person or an engineer. You've, you're, even if you're not on a team that's building an IoT device directly, you're probably going to be affected at some point by IoT. And I want to try to give you a framework for how to think about it. That, that's my goal. So I framed the talk in four questions. Uh, what is IoT? What is not IoT? Why does IoT disappoint or delight? So let's jump in. First and foremost, what is the Internet of Things? It's really hard, I've found, to get a concise, clear, easy definition. Uh, so my first pass at that is, IoT is a solution to a user's problem. If a user is trying to get through a door, IoT is like that key that unlocks the door to, to, uh, as a tool to let that user accomplish their goal, uh, to end the pain. And uh, it might sound obvious, but more valuable problems have more valuable solutions. So coming back to that first slide where IoT can be disappointing, one of those consistent, repeatable ways that I've seen IoT be pretty disappointing is that it's an IoT solution for a problem that's not really compelling. It's not a really valuable problem. And I can tell you, if you're working on a problem that's not high value, there's no way your solution's going to be high value. Another thing to think about uh, when someone's pitching you about an IoT device is IoT devices don't live in a bubble. It's not a matter of how great this IoT device is, how whiz-bang it is. Uh, it's how does the IoT solution compare to the existing solution? Because almost always there's a status quo. And so hopefully our IoT key in this metaphor is really, really good compared to a really poor status quo you know, conventional device. Another thing to keep in mind for the big picture is as much as we're talking about devices and everyone knows the device because we hold it in our hands, there's a lot below the surface with IoT that's not often there with other devices. So you need to keep in mind that there's aspects of designing the cloud and the service and there's a lot more than just the physical device itself. So I like to think of IoT as a natural evolution of the internet and I think it, it kind of can help to frame things this way. So what does that mean? Well, in the 1990s, the internet happened. And we all, what that meant was all, people had access to all the data in the world in the internet. It was great. But we didn't have it in all locations. We only had it in select locations, wherever our desktop computer happened to be residing, in our office, in our home, at school, in the library. And then in the 2000s, with smartphones, now we have the internet in our pocket. So we have all the data in the world. We can take it with us everywhere we go. And the two main use cases for that that I saw, I've seen are dealing, interacting with other people, like reading a news article or writing a Facebook post or sending a message, or dealing with devices, like looking up a recipe to figure out what's the right temperature to set the stove. And that second class, that dealing with information on the internet and how do, you how do you get the information on the internet between the internet and the devices, that's what IoT is all about. IoT is about removing that human intermediary. You no longer need the person to 
to transfer the data, and, and the, there's no more barriers between the devices and the internet. So I'm gonna have lots of examples to, to really give you something to anchor down to. Uh, this is a Ring video doorbell. Uh, it's really simple, it works great. Uh, it captures a short video of whoever's at the front door, sends it to your app so you can see who's at the door. Uh, we use this in our office because sometimes our admins are at the front desk. Um, maybe they're like taking care of a task and this way everyone else can help cover uh, without, uh, if no one else is at the front desk, we use this to, to solve that problem. So uh, I, I'm also gonna give lots of end-to-end -end examples to really make this clear. So before the 1990s, if you wanted to deal with navigation, you had to solve the problem yourself. Uh, with MapQuest, uh, the internet was able to tell you how to get where you wanted to go, but you couldn't take the information with you. You still had to print out that piece of paper with the instructions. And then uh, in the 2000s, we have smartphones, Waze, Google Maps. Uh, we could take the information with us, but we were still the intermediary. The humans still had to interact with, had to take the information from the internet and transfer it to control that device, that car. And so that's what self-driving cars in many ways are all about. It's cutting out the human intermediary. The car can communicate directly with the internet. Uh, I wanna really give a, a stronger definition than just IoT is a solution to a user's problem. I, I argue that IoT has four key characteristics. If you don't have these four key characteristics, you don't have IoT. Sensors, connectivity, computation, and user interface. So sensors, that means we're gathering lots of data about the world around us. Connectivity, we're gonna send it to the internet. Computation, now that we have this really big data set up in the cloud, uh, we can extract some meaning from it, extract some insights. And then we expose that uh, to our consumer through the user interface. Uh, data. Two optional components that I wanna highlight because they're really common in IoT devices are, one is batteries. Batteries are great. It means we could take our IoT devices wherever we wanna go. It doesn't have to be tethered to the wall. Uh, and actuators. Uh, if you guys don't know what an actuator is, don't worry, you use them all the time. An actuator is kind of like the opposite of a sensor. So sensors take what's happening in the real world and they turn it into digital data. So cameras and microphones take sound and light and they convert it into digital data. Uh, actuators just do the opposite. They take that digital data and they convert it into uh, something in the real world. So the display and the speakers on our phones convert light and sounds you know, into something in the real world, data into action. So that's, uh, in brief, what I would say IoT is. But you might say, hey, I've seen all that stuff before. What's new? Why, why is that different from anything else I've ever seen? Well, IoT is different from conventional devices, and IoT is different uh, from smartphones. And let's examine why. In, if I had to boil down IoT versus conventional devices, I would say we're looking at the difference between one and many. And I'll give some examples. So, Connectivity. I grew up in New Jersey. We had, my parents had a garage look just like this with a remote control that looked just like that. And the thing about that remote control car, yeah, it had connectivity, but it was really limited. There was only one remote control that could control that garage. By contrast with the Internet of Things, now any phone can get an app and control a door lock. This example here is with the August smart door lock. Uh, so we're, we're shifting from just one to many. Uh, another example are updates. So when you buy a conventional device, uh, whatever you get on day one, your device is gonna always be that way. It's not gonna change with time. It's not gonna improve over time. By contrast, with IoT devices, you can start to expect improvements. So Tesla, for instance, uh, regularly updates their autopilot feature. And probably the most important difference between conventional devices and IoT devices is the way that we deal with data. So historically, whenever we needed to gather data, it was sporadic and manual, a person had to do it, uh, it was tedious, it's expensive, and we didn't really capture lots of data, but with the Internet of Things, now all of a sudden we're capturing huge amounts of data, we can do it continuously and automatically. Uh, Ada is a really exciting device, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit deep dive on this product. Uh, so Ada makes a wearable thermometer, uh, and that, that can measure core body temperature. And you guys all look healthy. But for people that are not, uh, it solves a really important problem. So if someone uh, is going through chemotherapy or if we're talking about a uh, premature baby in the neonatal intensive care unit, these are people where they have compromised immune systems, their lives are really at risk uh, of getting sick. And one of the first signs that they're sick is their core body temperature shoots up, they get a fever. And so today, or up until today, uh, the way that this is dealt with is a nurse like this woman here will go around the neonatal intensive care unit and measure the baby's temperatures every 15 minutes. 
it's tedious for the nurse, it's not comfortable for the babies, and she's not getting a lot of good data. By contrast, now that same baby could wear an ADA patch with uh, this wearable thermometer on it. It's much more comfortable for the baby. We're getting a lot more data, and the doctors are able to recognize when there's a problem much more quickly and take action to save that baby's life. So this is kind of the paradigm shift that you're looking at with conventional devices versus IoT devices, going from one to many. At the same time that IoT, oh, sorry, uh, and just to give an end-to-end -end example, uh, thermostats, so we have the conventional thermostat that a lot of us have seen. Um, by, by contrast, we have the Nest Learning thermostat, so it has all these different qualities that I'm talking about. Uh, connectivity, it connects to lots of different phones, uh, many gathering many, many data points, and updates. So Nest, for instance, added a family feature. So uh, as we're thinking about this, everything I've said so far is one IoT device versus one conventional device. Where I think IoT gets really exciting is when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That happens for IoT, but it doesn't happen for conventional devices. So one, uh, one example is Kinza. Kinza makes this really cool smart uh, thermometer. And yeah, it's nice that you can now measure your temperature and track your health with your phone. But where Kinza gets really exciting is when they take that huge data set that they have and they're able to understand public health at a scale that we've never seen before. And that's going to make all of us healthy. Another way to think about these network effects are network effects between different types of devices. So uh, again, if you, you haven't heard of APIs, you use them all the time. API stands for Application Program Interface. It's the way software communicates. So if uh, you've ever logged in with, with Facebook to an app, uh, you're using the, the Facebook API, for instance. So uh, what this means is it's really easy, because of all this internet connectivity out there, to share data, to pass information around. So it's, you can easily envision how we could take this Ring uh, smart doorbell, take an image of who's at the front door, send that image to some facial recognition software in the cloud, uh, recognize, yep, it is the homeowner, and then tell the August smart door lock, it's time to unlock. And you could also see how now the August and the Ring, they work together in this you know, synergistic way. So they enhance each, each product. That, the whole is more than the sum of the, the parts. That doesn't happen with a conventional doorbell and door lock. As much as conventional devices are not the same as IoT devices, uh, they're all, smartphones are also really different from IoT. And the key difference, I would say, between smartphones and IoT is one word, love. We love our smartphones. And that makes a lot of sense because we really, really like our apps, and smartphones are packed with apps. And what I think is kind of interesting is you can actually measure how much we love our smartphones. We spend a lot of cash and a lot of effort on our phones. So what that means is we pay for an expensive monthly data plan. We have this social convention that when you walk into a new place, the first thing you say is, hey, can I get your Wi-Fi password? And of course, we're constantly charging our phones. All of that effort makes tons of sense for smartphones, but it breaks for IoT. So we only like our IoT devices. We don't love them the same way. So IoT can't require an expensive monthly data plan. Consumers who buy IoT products, you know, they're going to get that. They might be willing to get it on Wi-Fi once, maybe twice. But after that, they're, they're just going to get bored with it. They're not going to invest all that effort. And of course, they don't want to have to charge it all the time. Again, I really want to hit this point, because when you think of uh, disappointing IoT devices, again, what I've often seen happen is that the device is designed with the expectation that the user will treat it like a second smartphone. And they might do that for a day, maybe two, and then all of a sudden it winds up in the drawer, and it's another disappointing device. So uh, keep this in mind as we think about uh, how to really delight consumers. So, we're going to talk about disappointment and delight. <clears throat> so there today, I, I feel like, especially in the Bay, even though there's not a ton of IoT folks here, there's this herd mentality to IoTify everything. It's this buzzword. And I would on, argue that it's, there's some trends that are driving this, and they cause uh, these specific failures that I want to focus on. So one of the key trends is that sensors and actuators are now small and digital. So up until recently, uh, if you wanted to measure stuff, uh, you know, like a thermometer, it's this big, bulky device. You have to actually have a human being go and read what the temperature is. It's really not convenient for shrinking it in and putting it inside a device and, or getting that data out in any conven con, uh, convenient way. 
Um, and so this paradigm shift to having you know, small microchips that have these sensors in them, uh, that, that's reduced these physical constraints that, um, that were keeping, keeping us from creating IoT devices until now. Another uh, constraint, you might say, great, so I can pack my devices physically full of, I of sensors, but how much does it cost? Is it affordable? Well, many IoT components are now cheap commodities. Uh, we've seen prices drop 10x in 10 years. And this is all because of the economies of scale created by smartphones. So smart, a lot of these components between IoT and smartphones, they're the same types of components. And so the price reduction, it means that it's now really economical to uh, IoTFI devices. So what does this look like? What, what is the, how has the market changed over time? So, oh, sorry, before I get to that, uh, I just want to mention, personally, this has uh, affected me in a really fun way. Uh, when I started my career, uh, I, my first thing I worked on were microsensors. Uh, I, you know, com little computer chips like that with uh, motion sensors inside accelerometers. And at the time, uh, the only types of devices where it made economical sense to use a chip like that was a million dollar missile. And today, that exact same technology is in dog collars. So we've had this huge shift of economics from you know, IoT devices that, that needed where the sensors only made sense if it was a missile, and we've now shifted to dog collars. So it used to be that there was a really small universe of what was technically possible to IoTify. But like I said, the lowered physical constraints have made that universe start to grow really fast. And now those lowered economic constraints have also really started to expand the universe. And the problem, in essence, has shifted. It's now really easy to IoT to find devices, but it's really hard to find high-value problems that it's worth IoTifying. And so, again, when you say, like, why are there these disappointing IoT devices in the market, I'm going to argue that they're not in that circle of value, that they're somewhere else there, that people are building them just because they can, not because it's actually a useful, valuable device to have. So I'm going to now kind of quickly go through this basic recipe I've been talking about and then talk about where it breaks and causes uh, disappointment. So like I said, everything starts with users and a problem. Hopefully they have a mediocre status quo solution. Uh, we're going to solve it with an IoT device. That means we're going to put some sensors and connectivity in our device and send lots of data to the cloud. Uh, we're going to use computation user interface uh, to extract some meaning out of that data and expose it to the user. And hopefully, we'll benefit from network effects also. So when we have these disappointing devices, it's often because they're breaking at least one part of this recipe. So what does that mean? That means uh, users might have a problem, but it's not really a $100 problem. Uh, why $100? Because first, that's like the minimum price point that I generally see in the market for IoT devices. It's rare that it's uh, much cheaper than that. Often, it's much more expensive. Uh, the other thing to remember is IoT devices are inherently complicated. So if, that means that the users are going to have a learning curve. And if they have a learning curve, they're going to need the, some motivation to, to put in that effort to learn how the device works. If it's an, a device that costs more than 100 bucks, yeah, they might try a little bit. But if it's cheap, they're probably not going to put the effort in. Another issue could be that the current solution is good enough. There's nothing really here to solve. Uh, Maybe we're, we have sensors in our device, but they're not gathering lots of data. Uh, there's connectivity, but it's painful. It's really tedious for the user to maintain, or it's not secure. They're really worried someone's going to take their data and use it in a way they didn't intend. Uh, maybe there's computation, but it's not really extracting insights. The UI doesn't really facilitate action or control. Uh, and there's no useful network effects. And th I really want to hit this word, useful, because this is another kind of problem that I've seen. Yes, today we've hit the point where you could probably connect your toaster oven to your television set, but that doesn't mean it's a useful thing to do. That adds complexity, and often it makes it worse for the consumer, not better. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. Uh, so with all this in mind, uh, my colleague Ludo and I, Ludo, come quick say uh, uh, hello. Uh, hello. Um, we wanted to use, create an IoT device to solve this problem. How much does my piggy bank weigh? Uh, so we created the Jamboni. Uh, like Michelle said, uh, Orange is a French company, and Jambon means ham in French. 
so the Jamboni, it's a pig on a scale with, an IoT, with a cloud connection and an app. This is an awful product. <laughs> Everything about this stinks. It's a piggy bank. There's no way you have $100 worth of change in there. No one's going to pay 100 bucks for this thing. There's a sensor that weighs the piggy bank, but it only measures the weight monthly. It's never measuring data. There's a Bluetooth connection. Bluetooth can be great, but you, in this case, it's, it's a really bad connectivity solution. This means that the user has to walk over to the pig, get the data out of the pig and into the internet, into the cloud. It stinks. There's, not, we're capturing the data in the cloud, but we're not doing anything with it. It's, the UI just exposes it straight back to the user. And yeah, there's an API integration with Nest. So now I can send my pig data to Nest, but it doesn't enhance Nest. That makes no sense. Um, there's lots of devices that will enhance your Nest, and it, but not this pig. So if anyone tries to sell you a Jamboni, run away screaming. Uh, so of course, I'm, I like that you guys are getting the joke. You're laughing. This is not what we do. Uh, what does the Orange IoT Studio really do? We focus on connectivity solutions for the Internet of Things. Um, one thing that you guys will be hopefully benefiting from in the years to come are IoT connectivity solutions that are much, much easier to use than Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Um, and one of them that we've chosen to focus on is called LoRa. It's a long-range, low-cost, low-power, low-data rate solution. If you're curious about it or if you want to even try it out, come talk to me or Ludo. We're happy to tell you all about it. Um, so now that we've gotten through disappointment, and I promise you the Jamboni is the bottom of the disappointment barrel, uh, how do we get to delight? And that, that's what we came here to talk about, delightful delight devices. So I'm, I'm into IoT, so I bet I'm definitely into measuring everything. Uh, so it's not enough for me to say the IoT solution has to be an improvement over the status quo. It needs to be a 10x improvement. Uh, I took this uh, from Phil Boyer from Crosslink Capital. I like that he says it's either got to be 10x cheaper 10x better, or ideally both. Um, so let's really quantify the improvement if we can. So I'm going to kind of go through this recipe and highlight when, when things work, what does it look like? Uh, so we start again with users with a problem. It's a high value, $100 or more problem. Uh, we're going to pack our device with sensors and gather lots of data. We talked about how Ada is gathering lots of uh, temperature data. We're going to have connectivity that just works. That's really, really easy for the user. Uh, this is a really cool company called Omada Health. Uh, they make a comprehensive solution for people with prediabetes to, keep, to prevent them from becoming diabetic. It's a, high val it's a really big problem, costs a bunch of money, it's, no one wants to get diabetes. Um, and the problem that these people have is they can't change their habits. And Omada has a solution to do that. But one of the key things for Omada is they need to get uh, the weight of the people in, that are participating in their program. They need to know if they're losing weight. Because if you can lose weight, you can lower your risk of getting diabetes. And they have a, a scale. It looks just like that. They have the scale that um, it, it's IoT if I'm, they use a cell connection, like a SIM card. And there's a lot of other IoT scales in the market. There's, some use Bluetooth, some use Wi-Fi. I've tested a bunch of them out myself. And I can tell you, I, I'm an expert in this thing. And it's really hard to maintain. It often falls off the network. It, or it unpairs, or something goes wrong. And Omada recognized that if they gave that scale to their uh, participants, it, it wasn't going to work. They weren't going to get the data that they need. They weren't going to be able to solve this really important problem around prediabetes. So their solution, you take it out of the box, you turn it on, and it just works. The same way that you know, when we turn on our cell phone, it just works. Now, my point is not that cell connectivity is the end-all, be-all. Um, I think there are, like I said, there's more solutions coming down the pipeline, but the key thing is connectivity needs to be super simple, it needs to just work, and users need to not have to worry about it. Moving on to Insights. Uh, this is another company I'm a big fan of. When you want to talk about Insights, you can talk about Bloom Life. Bloom Life makes a wearable patch for pregnant women, uh, and it answers this really, really important question for them. Either no, don't worry, uh, you're just having an upset stomach, or yes, you are about to give birth, get to the hospital right now. Uh, and it, for user interface and uh, network effects, I wanted to talk about the Amazon Echo and Alexa, because I think it, it really highlights uh, both these ideas. So first, user interface, everything I've showed you up till now has been an app. Uh, the point of the Amazon Echo and the Alexa, since uh, I gathered there's not a ton of IoT people here, if you haven't used it or seen one of these, um, it, you just talk to it. You just say, you know, 
Alexa, play John Mayer, and she starts playing John Mayer. It's really nice. Um, so it's a voice UI. So the thing that I really like about it is it's a new, when we think about user interface, just think more than an app. I know our, everyone's instinct is, I got to make an app. Uh, but it could be a bot, it, like, or you know, in Messenger or in Slack. It could be uh, an Alexa skill, which is the equivalent of an app but voice. Uh, there's lots of different types of UIs, and it all comes back down to the consumer that we're trying uh, to solve their problem. And then the other thing I want to highlight here is useful network effects. And this is something I think that uh, Alexa is getting right. Uh, for those of you guys who don't intimately follow the IoT market, a few years ago, everyone was talking about Nest, Nest, Nest. Um, and then there's always, every year there's almost a new uh, phenomenon. But Alexa has definitely been the talk of uh, the Consumer Electronics Show this year and in a lot of places. And I actually think it's really well deserved. And the reason is because every device that integrates with Nest has this beneficial, synergistic, useful network effect. Uh, because Alexa offers a second user interface. People don't always want to have to get out their phone to interact with their IoT devices. So for instance, in my home, I have lights. I have um, a heater that's connected, uh, internet connected. Sometimes I want to use my phone because I want to you know, be quiet. I don't want to shout. Other times, I don't have my phone on me, and I'll just shout across the room, you know, Alexa, turn on the heater, and it just goes on. And so that, ha that synergistic uh, benefit, where the Alexa makes the heater better, that's what IoT looks like when it's done right. So again, end-to-end -end example. I want to make sure you guys can uh, know exactly what we're talking about. You're looking over here at very, very old technology. This is like decades old ways of monitoring pool water quality. Um, it's a very expensive and very painful thing. And the picture on, uh, on the other side of the screen, uh, if you don't remember from last summer, is the Rio Olympics. That's a, one of those green pools that the swimmers were really not pleased with. The reason I'm showing that is to make the point that even the professionals have trouble keeping their pools clean. So you can imagine how hard it is for just a residential consumer. So all of this is now solved through the miracle of the Internet of Things. Uh, with this device called the Sutro, uh, it gets all the, these parts of the recipe right. So it has sensors. It's measuring the pool temp the water temperature, and the pH, and the chlorine. Uh, it takes that data, and it sends it to the cloud, where it extracts an insight. It tells the user what they really care about. Yup, you're OK. Get in the pool. The water is safe. Or no, don't go in the pool yet. There's something wrong with the water. In order to fix it, you need to add three scoops of acid, or whatever the, the diagnosis is. Um, that, you actually do put acid in pools. Uh, I've, I've used this thing. Um, and of course, it exposes that uh, through the UI. Uh, Sutra also benefits from those uh, network effects I've been talking about. Uh, so for those of you guys who remember Flint, Michigan, um, they had a lot of problems with water. And so as Sutro begins to really deploy uh, in force, and they're monitoring lots of pools across a geographic area, they're going to be able to start to detect anomalies where, um, because we drink the same water that we put in our pools, if all the pools start changing in this really abnormal, strange way, they'll be able to say, no, it isn't just a couple crazy people calling into the city hall saying that something's wrong. We've detected it. We've seen this. We've got to fix this problem now. Another thing that Sutro uh, gets right is integrating with other uh, companies. So, Amazon Dash Replenishment Service. It's a service that Amazon lets other apps, uh, allows you to order through Amazon via other apps. So in the Sutro app, there's, they, they're, they're tracking your pool chemicals. And when you get low on chemicals, they give you the option with one click to have a refill come to your house through Amazon. Super simple, really convenient for, uh, for the user. So uh, I now want to kind of think bigger. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping up now, but I, wanna, I really want to leave you guys with some, some bigger thoughts. So it's not enough in my mind to just uh, look at a conventional device and say, why don't we, what would happen if we do IoT? I think that there's a lot of places where we can create IoT solutions that have never existed before. So one example is uh, we can replace an entire behavior with an IoT device. So the typical way of doing this is you, know, you have your detergent, you run out, you put it on the list, eventually you go shopping. Amazon, I think, got this right, too. With one button, you can click this button and have Tide show up at your house tomorrow. Super simple. It uh, takes that whole behavior and it shrinks it down to just a simple button. And uh, another thing that I think is cool with IoT is we can create new business models. So typically, when we go buy a device, a piece of hardware, or whatever, you go to the store, maybe you buy it online, you, you pay your money, and you're done. 
Uh, but with IoT, we, now we have this kind of hybrid situation where it's part product, part service, and you can match the, what you're doing to the user's needs. So with Bloom Life, of course, if you're dealing with uh, pregnant women, they're not going to use this device forever. And so Bloom Life has very deliberately uh, structured their pricing model in a way that aligns with uh, their customers' needs. Some women want to use it more, some want to use it less, and this way there's a small initial setup fee and then just a weekly recurring fee after that. Um, and then the last thing, and this is one of the things that I'm personally super duper excited about, are paradigm shifts in terms of what we even can measure. So I thought this was really funny. There, there's these two articles. How could they both be right? So the first one says, study claims Fitbit trackers are highly inaccurate. Uh, and then the next one says, how a Fitbit may have helped save this guy's life. Like, how could those both be true? That, that, that seems like antithetical. It's got to be one or the other. But it's not. You have to understand what IoT means versus the conventional solution. So up until now, if you want to get your heart rate monitored or some other uh, vital sign, you go to your doctor. The doctor has really good equipment. They're going to take really high precision measurements. Like, they're going to get it right for that instant. And then you don't know what's going on until the next time you go to the doctor. And that could be, there could be lots of time between measurements. So really infrequent measurements, but done at high precision. Sometimes uh, reality matches the assumption. You know, they're not too far off. But other times, reality is going to be wildly off. So that's where the miracle of IoT comes in. Yeah, the, the sensors in this Fitbit, for instance, are not going to be as good as what you're going to get in the doctor's office. But we're going to be taking a lot more measurements. And so there's a, this paradigm shift where we're able to better under, where we can actually have uh, a better understanding of people's health over time. And in this case, this, this isn't a joke. So this guy uh, in this picture, he had a heart attack in the afternoon. And he waited, like a lot of us would. Uh, and then in the evening, he just still felt awful, so he went to the hospital. And the doctor said to him, we need to know when you had that heart attack, because if you had it within the last hour, we're going to do one course of treatment. If you had it a few hours ago, we're going to do another course of treatment. They looked at that Fitbit data. Even though it wasn't perfect, they were still able to figure out that, yes, he did have that heart attack much earlier in the afternoon. They did that other course of treatment and saved his life. So this, I think, we're going to be seeing more and more of uh, where we have low precision, much higher frequency measurements that allow us to understand the world around us in a completely new way. Uh, more than that, I would say you should start to expect these delightful devices to almost fade into the background. I think Omada really nails that. Like, nobody cares about their scale. People care about preventing diabetes. And, I th and you, Omada could not provide a solution today without an IoT scale, but it's, it's only part of the background. It, it's really not the, the front and center thing, but it's a huge part of delivering the value. So uh, I just want to acknowledge I've had a bunch of good feedback uh, on this Prezo. So if anyone else has feedback, please let me know. I might even throw your name up there. Uh, and yeah, I'll wrap up by saying there's lots of opportunity for IoT to delight. And it won't be disappointing with the right design. Thank you.